A very good morning to you. Thank you for joining me on this edition of News Desk. I'm Bernice Abubedu Lamsa. In our headlines, Bank of Ghana rejects claims it's to blame for the over 60 billion CD loss in its 2022 fiscal year report as it exposes failings of government's 2022 budget for the anomaly. Also, major road linking northeast region to the southern part of the country remains cut after heavy rains, leaving many commuters stranded. We'll get talking with regional emergency officials for the latest. Haulage trucks transiting Tema take over streets of the harbour city with dangerous parking, risking the safety of other road users. We'll hear from residents of Tema who are asking city authorities to check the prevailing lawlessness endangering their lives. We also have business and more in this hour. Kindly stay with us. It's a pleasure to have you here. Now we are live on DSTV channels 421 and on your digital television around the world via myjournalonline.com. Now the Bank of Ghana says the faults in government's 2022 budget failed to address fiscal concerns. The minority this week gave the governor and his deputies 21 days to resign over a 60 billion CD loss the bank incurred or they'll pick at their premises. But in an explosive response, the governor, Dr. Ernest Addison, indicates the central bank cannot be blamed for the losses. My colleague, Elton Broby, has excerpts of the governor's reactionary statement. Elton, uh, what gaps are there in the 2022 budget that the Bank of Ghana refers to? Hello, Elton. Hello, Elton. Yes, Benis. Right. So I'm asking uh, you to show us the gaps that the Bank of Ghana references. So according to the statement, in two parts, actually, one responding to the 60.8 billion Ghana cities, and the other one directly responding to the minority NDC statement or news conference that they, they had on Tuesday. Now let's deal with the gaps that they identified in the 2022 budget. According to the Bank of Ghana, uh, they said that as a result of the fiscal deficit in 2020, a sovereign spread on Ghana's bonds widened, signaling investor dissatisfaction. According to the budget for 2022, which was read in 2021, failed to address fiscal concerns as the budget was even more expansionary by about 23% with a raft of revenue measures to raise financing. As a result, the credit rating agencies, Fitch and the rest, further downgraded Ghana's sovereign debt rating which brought Ghana's access to international capital market borrowing. This, according to the Bank of Ghana, triggered a liquidity crisis, spilling over into a balance of payment crisis. Now, external and domestic payment needed to be made. The domestic auction was failing, and the Bank of Ghana, according to the statement, had to step in to arrest a major economic, social crisis that, you know, uh, the country was faced with. Mm. And so is it that the bank is... It's suggesting that he raised a grim outlook on the economy prior to the IMF intervention? In fact, the bank itself has been, you know, pointing out the, the hits it took so that the Ghanaian economy will stay afloat. Now, it revealed that in two months, the, the Bank of Ghana lost 500 million US dollars in reserves and built a significant overdraft with the government as a result of the auction failures. According to them, it became clear that Ghana was on a path that was unsustainable. And the government had approached the IMF for support in July 2022. The IMF process included putting into place a credible program of reforms, which included restructuring of the total government debt to sustainable levels. Until staff level agreement with IMF was reached in December 2022, the Bank of Ghana had to continue to provide the necessary support to keep the economy running. So until government received the yeah, IMF failed bailout, according to the state, the Bank of Ghana was financing government programs so as to keep the, 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 the economy from collapse. 
Mm. Um, Elton, is there any more we should know? Does the statement directly address the, the demand by the minority for the governor and his deputies to resign? So the minority news conference also pointed out what they claim to be the bad financial state of the Bank of Ghana and the need for new hands to be at the helm of affairs, you know, accusing the governor of running down the central bank. Now, the Bank of Ghana has a, has a response for that. They say that central banks like Bank of Ghana are not commercial banks. They say that this financial outcome has very little implication for the operations of the Bank of Ghana. That is the 60.8 billion Ghana cities are supported by evidence from other central banks. And they, they've made reference to the, the England Central Bank, where they supported the economy with billions of pounds sterling during the COVID era. And they say that technically, central banks cannot be insolvent or bankrupt. It is not possible, according to the Bank of Ghana, dismissing claims that the, the financial position of Bank of Ghana is in dire strait, and for that reason, there should be some reform. So this is just one aspect of the response that uh, they provided last night. There's also another statement that directly take on key pronouncement by the minority NDC in their news conference on Tuesday, and then they address them as well. Elton Brober is editor here at Joy News, giving us details of the BOG's statement reacting to calls for the governor and his deputies to resign over some losses the BOG incurred. Joining us live now is Dr. Saeed Boachi. He's a banking consultant and uh, will be taking his thoughts as well. Doc, first, what do you make of what the bank says, that the economy was at the brink of collapse, it had to step in, that, you know, is an excuse for, for the losses they made, suggesting that it was, it was the budget that did not make room for all these fiscal issues. Okay, before I speak, let me correct you. I'm not a banking consultant. I'm an economist, not a banking consultant. Anyway, that's just by the way. Um, why I'm not in the position to be able to fully exonerate the uh, Bank of Ghana, because I don't have all the details the nitty-gritty of it. Nevertheless, people should cut the Bank of Ghana a flag. In a sense that, you know, what happened in 2022 was very unusual. The government had planned its budget. And in the first quarter, it had planned to go and borrow 4 billion US dollars from the Eurobond bond, Euro bond market, bond market. As a result of the downgrade, the country, was, the country was virtually blocked from that market. Meanwhile, the government had done its own planning. What we should also understand is that it is not easy for government to retrench money or the biggest part of this budget. Look at compensation of employees, debt service, and others, which are even more than revenue. Secondly, revenue also underperformed. The Bank of Ghana had to step in, and everybody has to understand this. Everybody has to understand this. The Bank of Ghana has to step in. In addition to IMF, IMF also has to understand that. And that is why in our review of the IMF program, we are telling IMF that you cannot put that block, that limit on our Bank of Ghana intervention. That is what is done everywhere in the world. When the central bank is in deep fiscal trouble, deep liquidity trouble, the central bank has to step in. So definitely the Bank of Ghana has to step in. Even though I do not know the amount involved that was supposed to be involved and if they had overdone it it's another thing but just saying that the bank of ghana stepped in and has led to bank of ghana losses is not here not that the bank of ghana has to step in look in the middle of uh, what we were experiencing in 2022 labor unions they were so free because of inflation they needed more they needed more salary the government had to respond and it was true because inflation was so high where would the government get the money from Revenue was also underperforming. So what I'm saying is that if there is any blame, it should not be placed on the Bank of Ghana, but rather the government that has for a long time mismanaged the country's finances. The blame should go to, 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 to the government because we have been warning the government that this catastrophe was in the process and it was coming. But the government didn't pay attention. So if anybody has a blame, it should be leveled at the government, mm. a post that fails to hit warnings.
and brought the country to where uh, we, we were in 2022, and Bank of Ghana had to step in. Right. And, and Doc, the BOG also says that it was used as a loss absorber uh, during the debt exchange program so we could reach our target to, to get an IMF deal. Now, th this, for many people, raises a lot of qu questions about the independence of the bank. Look, 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 look. People should forget about the independence of the bank. I've worked at the Bank of, uh, at Minister of Finance before. And when I was there, the Bank of Ghana was selecting its muscle that it is independent. The Bank of Ghana is not independent. It is the banker for the bank, uh, for the government. And not only the banker for the government, the government owns it. And it is needed to support the fiscal uh, uh, authorities to implement government, uh, uh, what do you call it, a uh, program and project. For that matter, the government, uh, if the Bank of Ghana claims that it is independent, it is not completely independent. So if the government was in trouble regarding the uh, Bank of Ghana accepting, uh, it is in order. Because if everything had been placed on the private sector, in the uh, home holders and uh, uh, commercial banks, perhaps the problem would be uh, worse than it is. So Bank of Ghana stepping in to support is a good thing. And people should understand that. Mm. Uh, there's also the reaction of the Bank of Ghana to suggestions by other economists and consultants that, I mean, based on what the books say, it has gone bankrupt. The bank says it can never go b bankrupt and that people should, you know, be calm about it. What are your impressions about that as well? Whether the bank is bankrupt or not, we all pray that it is able to step on its uh, uh, feet uh, as soon as possible. Well, <laughs> bank of Ghana going bankrupt, of course. We hope that it will be able to carry out this operation. That is what is important to me. The government of Ghana going bankrupt and affecting the entire economy is worse than the Bank of Ghana going bankrupt. Right. So we all hope that the Bank of Ghana will be able to stand on its feet and play, uh, and play its punch better well. That is what is important. Doc, we've heard the explanations of the BOG. Would you generally then say that we can give them a pass, you know, for the, for the losses? And, and also because it says that it's committed to ensuring that this doesn't recur. Look, that is why I've told you before, when you review the IMF program, I said when the government misbehaves and such a thing happens, the Bank of Ghana will have to step, step in. So this so-called zero financing is not about neither here nor there. But the, uh, 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 the IMF has to understand that. When you go to the U.S., we all uh, uh, saw quantitative, quantitative easing. The European Central Bank was doing quantitative easing to support the economy. In, uh, in 2008, when the country, uh, the, the, there was a global financial crisis, why is it that the Central Bank of Ghana cannot do things? Even though I understand, and I do understand, if there's a blame on Bank of Ghana, it should be in 2020, when it supported the government effort to win elections by, by lending so much to the government. When it was not needed, needed to me, much of the lending to the government was not needed in 2020, but they supported the government to get liquidity to be able to find the election. So if somebody is blamed Bank of Ghana, it should be in 2020, not what happened in 2022. Finally, Doc, uh, the minority is demanding that the BOG governor and his deputies resign. Uh, do you agree with that call? So that one, I, I can't say anything about it. That is politicking, and I don't do politics. Right. Do you think the BOG governor could have done a better job? That I started by saying I don't know all the details, but you should, you should cut, cut the Bank of Ghana as large. Generally, overall, what they did was in the, uh, in the right direction. But as to the details, I do not know. Right. I appreciate your time this morning. Dr. Said Boache is an economist, and he was sharing his thoughts with us on the reaction of the BOG to the calls by the minority for its governor and deputies to resign. Well, the executive secretary of the Importers and Exporters Association of Ghana, Samson Awingabit, has backed uh, the NDC minority's demand uh, for the BOG governor to leave because of the losses, the minority on Monday, August 8, 2023, demanded the resignation of Governor Dr. Ernest Addison over claims of running down the country's economy due to his incompetence. Reacting to this, Mr. Wingerbit asserts the demand is essential to rescue the central bank's reputation. I think this issue should not be only left to only the minority alone to, to be talking about it or to be fighting about it. Um, this issue has to do with Ghana. 
and every level-headed Kenyan rifle thinker should be should be worried because if you remember 2018 2019 there about there were some collapse of financial institutions by the governor of Bank of Ghana and his board of directors what was it the reason was that these banks had mismanaged and these banks were in insolvency and because of that the, the governor of Bank of Ghana overnight closed them down today we are seeing the same regulator who is saying that he's writing off certain debts about 48 billion we are seeing the same governor or the same bank of Ghana who is saying that they have made losses over 60 billion. And so you think that if the other MD of a commercial bank could not stay in, at post, uh, and their staff could not stay at post, you can be at post when you have also caused that same uh, issues. What were the reasons? The reason was that if they did, they did not take that decision to collapse those commercial banks at that time, uh, the, our city was not going to be s with strong, resilient, and the economy was not going to be very resilient. Is that not it? And so today, it is now hit at your doorsteps. What decision? If I were to be in principle, you don't, you don't, they did not need the governor did not need the NDC as a political party to call for his head or for, for him to resign. Honestly, if, in principle, if I were to be the governor of Bank of Ghana, I would I Samson Asaki would have resigned. Meanwhile, Mr. Wengobet recommends a stronger collaboration between the Finance Ministry and the Bank of Ghana towards addressing the country's economic woes. Um, going forward, I strongly believe that uh, the, Bank of the, the Bank of Ghana and the Finance Ministry should be talking to, to, to each other. I think today, I don't know if you are very much aware that today, as we speak, the inflation rate has gone up and food inflation rate is leading. And I said it in the 2023 mid-year budget review, we were expecting the, the finance minister to abolish the COVID levy. We were expecting the, uh, the finance minister to abolish the 2% import levy. Then we were expecting the finance minister to at least give her the 30% back on the re restoration of the 30% on the Benjamin values. Based on that, import duty would have come down and there would have been instability. So far as you have taken, you withdraw the total reversal of the Benjamin values, where Ghanaians used to pay about, let's say, 70 times to clear for a container. And today, that same container will be cleared at 250,000 to 300,000. Definitely, you have directly brought in inflation to us. And, and, and I remember a week ago or so, the Bank of Ghana increased their prime rate, saying that they were doing that to make sure they fight or they fought inflation. And <laughs> little did they know that today, inflation has gone up again. So, quite clearly, I think the two institutions are not working. And when the two institutions are not in talking terms, definitely that, that, that is the, the suffering that will, they will bring to we the Ghana. Then, when you want to ask questions, then they are smart to say, I am in charge of financial policy and fiscal policy. That's the Minister of Finance. Then the Bank of Ghana say, I'm in charge of monetary policy. But when you have your fiscal policy and monetary policy not in talking terms, definitely they, they, leave, they leave you to inflation to struggle on your own. And that, that should not be the case. I strongly believe that the, finance, the current finance minister and the current governor of Bank of Ghana has filled the president of Kufuado government. And they have exposed the government to the extent that I thought it was only the domestic exchange program was affecting only commercial banks. I did not know that it also affected our bank of Ghana to the extent that if today we are we are to do uh, this that uh, assuming what happened at at, at Nigel okay to us I'm not saying it should it should happen but today if Nigel is in crisis with the sanctions that ECOWAS and others are, are issuing to, on them then it means that they cannot even feed themselves we cannot even feed the ourselves for only three weeks Away from the BOG, torrential rainfall on Wednesday caused the collapse of a huge colonial era dam at Tinguru in the West Mampusi municipality of the northeast region. Flood waters from the collapsed dam inundated the community, causing a bridge on the main Walewale Nalerugu road to wash off, splitting the road apart and leaving dozens of passengers and motorists stranded for hours. The heavy downpour also flooded homes and destroyed public utility in the East Mampusi municipality and the Yongyo district. Here are some affected persons speaking to Joy News. 
The torrential rains started at about 4 a.m. Wednesday and poured unceasingly until midday. The heavy rains across the region left a trail of destruction as homes were flooded and personal properties as well as public utilities destroyed. At Tingui in the West Mampersi municipality, the rains caused the community dam to collapse and excessive water spill from the collapsed dam submerged and washed away a bridge on the main Waliwali Naliruku road. The road was ripped apart by flood waters from the dam, causing several passengers traveling on the road to be stranded. Here are some residents of Tinguru and Bani who witnessed the collapse of the dam and the destruction of the road. You know, as you can see, a lot of farms have been destroyed and some people's houses have been broken down. So please, uh, if the government can come to our aid and they help us, and then they will see how they can they fix it for us. Because that cannot pass to Waliwali and that too cannot pass from Waliwali to Naliru. So the river has been uh, destroyed. We are unable to cross the Timbri, the same way the people of Timbri are unable to reach us. If you have any assistance, we need it immediately. The rain has caused a lot of havoc. It has destroyed our bridge and has rendered the road unmotorable. As you can see, if they didn't come and block it, dry season will not get water to build our houses. Our animals too will not get water to drink. So we are appealing to the stakeholders. Anyone who can come to our aid, we are pleading, please help us. If not, this year we will not find it easy. A group of travelers from Naliruku was seen stranded here in Bani. Although officials of the National Disaster Management Organization visited the scene, the stranded passengers said they did not provide any assistance to them. As a result, a group of young people in Tinguri and Bani mobilized themselves and discovered a new route where desperate travelers crossed for a fee. Passengers traveling in and out of the regional capital were offloaded at Tinguri and Bani, where they had to walk several miles or ride pillion the bush road to reach this new crossing point. Emmanuel is the leader of the group. So far, we are here since in the morning helping the people cross. As you can see over there, you can see our other police over there helping the other people over there. So when they come, we also help them go there. They come to the beach to where the destination they are going. So, they are doing. so we need help uh, with a bag. If anybody there around can help us with the back, with the back, North East Road, the main road of North East is broke. Today, this early in the morning, around 6 o'clock, rain, rain, uh, to 12 o'clock before it stopped, it broke the North East Road. It broke the North East Road. So we need help. The rains are said to have also caused significant damage to residential buildings and other properties in the East Mampresi municipality and the UU district. The disaster management organization said it could take days to conduct a full and complete assessment of the situation due to the intensity of destruction. The regional minister, who was also at the scene, declined to comment. The member of parliament for Nalergu Gambaga, Al Haji Baba Said Isifu, who was traveling to his constituency, was forced to return to Tamale at Tinguri. Flood and other weather related disasters are common in the northeast region. Some of the victims are blaming their leaders for neglecting them. As you can see, if you go inside, you see what is happening. It caused a lot of havoc inside. And all the time, we, we complained about it. But since that and up to now, authorities, they don't listen. Until sometimes, even something major happens, they don't come to our aid. When you come to our rooms, we can't sleep today. Where are we going to sleep? And sometimes when you complain, 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 they don't listen. They really want someone to die before they will now come to our aid. Or what do they want? Ilias Sutanko reporting from Tinguri for Joy News. Now, officials in the region, including the Disaster Management Organization, say for now it's impossible to conduct a comprehensive assessment of the situation. They've called for immediate national attention. Northeast Regional Director of NATPO, John Quickle Hassan, joins us with more. I'm, I'm great to, to have you this morning. You say that you need national attention before you'll be able to uh, conduct any proper assessment. Has that attention been given you now? Do you have support from the national level? Oh, as for the support, the support has always been there. But what we are saying is that yesterday we experienced a heavy downfall and uh, almost every part of the region was uh, flooded. 
And then uh, the Tungulu in question was that, uh, you know, there's a dam there uh, at uh, Bani. So the dam collapsed and then washed away the bridge. So NADMO and other security agencies were there to ensure that lots of properties are not lost. So I'm even surprised to hear some of them uh, making such comments that uh, they need assistance and they didn't get. What kind of assistance do they need and they didn't get? Well, we're there. Even the regional minister, the NCE for Westman Putin Municipality, NADMO officials were there. And we actually ensured that lots of properties were not lost. Right. So Okay, but I'm just asking, I mean, so have you been able to conduct the assessment now? Yesterday, and you know, the whole place was inundated with water. So we need uh, to take time for the water to receive before not more officials can even get onto the phone to do the proper assessment. Okay, and, and how, long, how long do you think this will take? That will depend on the, uh, the water. When the water is not receded and you go there, even you, the not more officials, uh, are in danger. Well, I suppose you have the, the, the equipment and all the other things you need to, to enable you to work in such situations, don't you? Uh, of the flood. Nobody is trapped. What we are saying is that it's the farms and the roads that are destroyed. And then we ensure that people should not even get closer to the disaster center so that they, they can be affected. All right, and so... we're on the ground. As mm. I speak to you now, we are on the ground monitoring the situation. Okay. And I'm told that the minister this morning... Uh, uh, told us that the Minister of Roads and Transport, they are coming to the, uh, the, the incident scene to assess the situation so that from there uh, we will see what we can do to help the, uh, the people uh, cross the other side. Is there an alternative for travellers? Come because again. I'm asking if there's an alternative for travellers because the bridge has been washed away. Are there any other routes they can use to connect That's to the rest we're, of the country? We are, we are waiting for the people from Accra to come. Uh -huh. Because they are the criminal class, and when they come, I think uh, uh, something can be done about the situation. No, the question I'm asking you is, because the bridge has been washed away, we are told that people cannot travel from the northeast region to the rest of the country. I'm asking, are there any other routes that are available, or they would have to stay on the well, other this, side? This morning, this morning, cars from Wale Wale park uh, at the other side, and then people have to cross the other side to board cars to Malirigu. But what we are saying is that it's the vehicles that cannot uh, cross to the other side. And it's not even uh, uh, that place alone. Even in the city area, it is the same thing. Uh, it's the water. The water that has caused the problem. Mm, uh, we appreciate that. But have you been in contact with the Ghana Meteo? Um, do we know if more rains are coming? Any information that residents of the place should know with regards to what the weather is going to look like in the, in the, in the, in the have, coming we days? Have, we have been doing the sensitization on the radio stations. We have also been doing community engagement. And even uh, since uh, yesterday, we continue to educate the people to move to a higher ground. And then uh, also they should be cured, uh, uh, cautious about their own future and be on their left. After that, what we have been doing, and we continue to do it. Because we're in the midst of the, 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 the race. You know, the the race, can, race can come at any moment from now. Okay, I'm grateful for your time. John Koko Hassan is Northeast Regional NADBO Director. I will stay a while longer on this issue. We are speaking now to the MP for Nalerugu Gambaga, Yusuf Baba. Good morning to you. Thank you so much. We just had from uh, the NADBO official in your area. Uh, but, but do you know if any plans have been made for, for the, 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 the constituents to receive some relief? Okay, good morning, and um, I appreciate this opportunity. I, I listened to the NADMO Regional Director with keen interest. Um, first and foremost, let me say that this is not a normal situation for NADMO to handle. Okay. For the past three years, we have been covering this uh, flood, and uh, bridges and infrastructure have been affected. But what I want to say is that um, this particular situation is not a normal situation, and the normal director must be calling for assistance. He must be calling for resources that will assist him to do his work. Now, as we talked, yesterday I was en route to Nalerigo to my constituency. Unfortunately, I couldn't get there. I tried a number of times, and it was extremely difficult for me because there was virtually no wind. The bridge around Banley was washed off. Uh, Banawa area was flooded. I tried to use an alternative route to um, uh, to uh, 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 Nasha and uh, Parbu. Mm -hmm. That didn't work. The whole route flooded. 
for us we speak now, there is actually no way somebody can access Nanergo Kambaga and for them as have been and the rest of those adjoining constituencies and communities. So it is a very serious situation. Three years ago, we had the same flag, and some bridges were washed off. I made a call. I even filed a question on the floor of parliament to that effect. Up to now, those bridges are still hanging. And those particular communities in Pimpela and Bukwajo, two bridges were washed off. Those communities for the past three years don't have access to, especially when we, have, when we are in the rainy season, getting to hospitals, getting to schools, coming out to do business and uh, carry on their economic, uh, even farming activities becomes a problem. So this particular one is a very serious one, a devastating disaster for us, and the national officer must be calling for government intervention. We need well, well we understand that the Minister for Roads and Highways is, is on his way there. Well, he's on his way there. I'm also, I'm also around, so we'll let you can see what he's coming to do. But what we are saying is that we need a very serious intervention because um, farms have been washed off. People have been in the farms for the past three months. Now their crops have been washed off. You know, cases are flooded, and people have been forced to evacuate their 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 their, their homes. Mm, so, so, so it is not a normal situation. So, Mr. Baba, you say that you say that something similar happened some time back. Yeah. Did we not anticipate this? Were there no plans in place to ensure that the, the, the floods did not, did not cause this devastation yes. like it, it has in, yes. in this? Yes. This issue has been going on for the past for some time now. And that is why the people are calling for, are, 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 are saying that they, are, they have been neglected. Now, if you look at the Walwali rule, last year we had the same flood. People had to create channels for water to, you know, you know, water to move from one end of the road to the other, you know, before they could be, before a matter could normalize for them. So what we need, to, what we are saying is that the road must be looked at on a more sustainable basis. We have to, the government must know that this is now a regional route. And the, 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 the number of vehicular traffic on the road has increased. So if the infrastructure is not raised to a level that will defeat the city and will create more, more bridges and more coverage, we are going to have these problems happening every time. Right. The drainage uh, system is that issue, and it has to be looked at. So the problem goes beyond that road. It needs a governmental intervention with dedicated resources to solve this problem once and for all. Uh, um, Mr. 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 Uh, Seydou, so the, the other question is that this is happening because a dam got broken. I, I'm just wondering, this dam we were told was built, was built during the colonial era. Were there any stress tests? Were there any assessments done over the years? Are you aware if anything like that happened? No, no. Wait, let, let me say that. Even if the, road, the dam was constructed during the colonial era, this road was recently constructed. You get a point. The road was recently constructed. So even if there were no feasibility studies as to the longevity of the dam, but the road was recently constructed. So the engineering should have taken cognizance of the fact that anything there could be spillage and things like that. So what we are saying is that the whole road stretch from Nalergo to Walwale and for them to Bumbulu requires civil engineering and requires dedicated resources from the government to be able to fix it. Thank you for so, your time. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you for your time this morning. Nisi Fusedu is MP for Nalirugu Gambaga. We'll stay in touch with you. Uh, also uh, seeing that the roads minister is expected to visit the site soon. Our man on the ground, Elias Atanko, will be finishing us with details. But away from the northeast region, residents of Tema are outraged because of chaotic parking of transit holly trucks on the major roads. This poses danger to their lives and drivers, as well as pupils of basic schools in the metropolis. 
Frustration mounts among them due to city authorities' inaction. They believe has emboldened these drivers to flout traffic rules and endanger the public recklessly. Michael E. Carlos Caloni reports from the port city of Tema. Tema, which used to boast as one of Ghana's foremost planned cities, is gradually losing its shine. And some have described the city as a decaying city due to a number of factors, including what you can see in your picture, where you find uh, transit trucks parking by the shoulders of the road here on the Harbour Road, exposing motorists to a lot of danger. Residents have been expressing concerns over this issue and would want to speak to Masaudu, who is a concerned citizen here in Tama about the situation and what he makes of the situation. As for this particular road, the transit people have taken over the road and it has narrowed the road. It has made sometimes when you want to cross the road, you don't see your view well. And it has, been, it has caused one or two accidents on this road. Several accidents, not one or two. And, and because of here, the street light and other things too are not working. When they park, darkness overshadows the area and robbers too also attack. The zebra crossing to its feet. So even the children crossing, a car has hit children one or two or three times here due to this particular situation. And it seems the authority are not concerned with it. A, a, a number of accidents has happened, which I've seen it with my own eyes. Yeah, I think a tanker driver, a, a small car, two cars, and the road was too narrow. So the other car need to hit the big truck on the road. The other uses the transit cars, which are parked on the road. So they have been seeing it, and the police people are all aware, because this is their route. In the evening, it's dangerous. We need to move there, even if the road is well, because of the weight. It's spoiling the road. When you talk to them that you should not park here, then they are fighting with you. The, the Burkina, I don't know whether Burkina or Mali. So you don't need them. And the people are complaining. Because sometimes when people drop from the car to cross, if you don't watch it well, you will hit by a car. It's very dangerous. So we need to remove it here. We need to remove them. Have you had any experience yourself or anybody hit by people? Yeah, several times. So now uh, we have some guys who normally stand here with a flag to direct the people to cross the road. Otherwise, they will hit by a car. It's very, very dangerous. In the evening, you can't stand them. All the time, I fight with them. We were really concerned to TMA. Uh, we reported to commander, the regional commander. I called them. They came here. Still, they are still parking. We don't know. This is our problem. We need to remove them. It's very dangerous. They are swearing the road. This is a Community 8, number 3 primary school, right by the road that goes to the harbor. Now, when the kids close from school, they come to this particular bus stop here, and they cross to the other side of the road to pick vehicles into their various homes. But right across the road is what you can see. The and According to residents, this is actually exposing the school kids to a lot of danger. This transit driver defends the illegal act with this excuse. This is a suck of the thing with the park for a year. Both times, if you come out for the fishing album, they're not going to give you your money, your advance, your everything. So that if you know, say, you take that, if you go, you know, say, you do road talk, you go. But they go, if you can't park you for a year. They go say they go bring you money. You go feed back like three days, four days before you go see the agent. You go bring the money for you. If like you not finish, they give you your money, your papers, your duties, everything. You do your road talk. You don't go pack for you. We they pack for you, Kura. They they steal us. They they steal our battery, our diesel. So you know we have our problem. Me I day here like three days with that. I pack for you since Friday. No, I come for you. When contacted, the Executive Secretary for Joint Association of Port Transport Unions, Japtu Ibrahim Musa, attributed three core factors as the root cause behind this menace. As a union, there are a number of factors that are contributing to that situation over there. Key in that is the fact that we do not have a designated track park for loaded trucks that exit from the port. The GPHA has shown the way by providing a track park 
that is mostly used by empty trucks behind the Community One Timber Market. This is a facility that GPHA made huge investment in acquisition and uh, putting in the required features and facilities. We have a mosque, we have washrooms, we have the required security, lighting and all of that. But this is primarily used by empty trucks. Well, that is one reason, the lack of a conducive uh, parking space. The second factor from our investigation also has to do with the delay in the payment of advance by cargo owners and their agents. Most of the time, once the cargo is loaded, the truck, the transporter has to wait for the advance to be paid, which is part payment for that contract. Now, until the payment is made, we are unable as transporters to officially start the uh, trip. So sometimes you see these trucks packed they're waiting to receive their advance. I remember three years ago at the sensitization forum that is organized annually by the Shippers Authority for Transporters. This issue came up very strongly to the point that as a union, we were even pushing for a policy of no advance, no loading, so that before a truck enters the port, at least the driver or the transporter would have given the advance. So once you are cleared, with the documentation side and you exit the port. You have no reason to loiter or park at unapproved or unauthorized locations. And then Carlos Coloni with that report and we'll take a quick breather now on news desk up next. Daryl Powell has the latest from the world of business. Do stay. Hello, my name is Abeiku Agri Santana. If there's anything that makes my life so easy, it is my bank. I love hanging out with my boys' boys at our usual fufu joint. But even without cash, we still the chop better with EcoBank Mobile. No matter the time of day, my bank helps me stay in touch with my beautiful wife whenever she's away. And when my beautiful wife is in town, she never misses out on her favorite TV shows because I'm able to pay up all my TV subscriptions from the comfort of my mobile phone. Whenever she has to get groceries too, my bank makes it cashless and convenient. And the part my wife loves the most is when my bank makes it possible and easy for her to shop from any part of the world without moving. <laughs> Welcome to the smart world of EcoBank. Download EcoBank Mobile from Google Play Store or the App Store and discover the smart way to bank. EcoBank, the Pan African Bank. From humble beginnings to the extraordinary. We've witnessed incredible bonds, the rise of legends in the most challenging of times, and the most unforgettable moments that kept us at the edge of our seat. Everything up till now was just the beginning. Legends go head to head as timelines have collapsed for the ultimate showdown. Welcome to Big Brother Niger All Stars. Starts 23rd July. Headline sponsor Money Point. Hi, welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao, Chief Director of the Ministry of Finance. Eva Mens is urging all accountants in the public sector to uphold the public financial management law to help reduce government's debt. Mens was speaking at the post-2023 Media Budget Forum organized by the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Ghana. A lot of MDAs do not do due diligence when it comes to project development. And so most project costs are understated. And then when it comes to actual implementation, 
there are lots of cost variations. So there are major challenges with, with how these areas are, are committed. For, for instance, you have companies who have done work for government and are not being paid. They've taken bank loans and are unable to pay these banks. It's, it, it creates bank impairment. Number two, on the side of government, we don't have good services that are delivered. And, and, and thirdly, I mean, as we speak, over 40% of all payments that we make regarding capital expenditure has to do with interest on delayed payments. So it's a very complex, multidimensional issue that we need to look at. And that's where accountants come in. Now, as online transactions are growing in the financial sector, so are fraudulent activities on the rise. Now, according to ZPay, the introduction of uh, uh, SIM card registration and Ghana card have helped reduce fraudulent cases. Here's more. In spite of the rising economic shocks, ZPay managed to grow in both total processed volume and revenue from $1.9 billion in 2021 to $2.9 billion in 2022. The company indicated that it is working tirelessly to reduce the activities of fraudsters to help reduce losses. In an interview with Joy Business, board chairman of ZPay Ghana, Daniel Jima, said the SIM card registration exercise and the Ghana card is helping to clamp down on fraudulent activities in the financial sector. We have a unique security system. We work with the cyber security agency on all the agencies. And therefore, I won't say we have eliminated it totally, but we have taken it to the barest minimum. Um, the national identification card has helped a lot. And also the SIM card registration has helped a lot. So we can easily go back and trace fraudulent transactions. And that has helped us minimize, and uh, we are hoping that in the final analysis, we can eliminate it. The main challenge has been declarations. You know, people want to transfer money, they don't want to declare who they are, who they are sending it to. And that's a breach of the law. You know, we must be open and people must understand that if we give a false declaration, it will be found out. Managing Director of ZPay Ghana, Andrew Techi Apia, said his outfit will ensure the continuous flow of remittances into the country. In 2020, when the world was running away, we decided to stay and fight. When the banks were closing, we decided to keep our doors open online so that our customers can send money and make it possible for the people of Ghana to receive their money. Um, about 27 of us stayed in office and made sure we worked tirelessly 24 hours to ensure that remittances will keep flowing rather than panicking about death. Um, beyond that, of course, our usual strategies would always remain. I would also like to remind everybody that in 2020 is when we built our beautiful office building. The company saw a growth in its assets from $20 million in 2021 to $53 million in 2022. And that's business. The news continues after the break. La Liga and Syria, the Premier League and UEFA games that matter, and the world's favorite cup competitions. Get Go TV Super for only two forty nine CDs to enjoy the football overload. Go TV. Joy 99.7 FM brings you another Joy Family Forum dubbed Becoming Mr. and Mrs. All you need to know before marriage. A breakfast meeting for singles led by Home Affairs and hosted by yours truly, Adam Knight Day. Our guest speakers for the day are Ghana's favorite uncle, Uncle Lebo White, and Reverend Mrs. Rita Crunchy Ankara, First Lady of the Royal House Chapel. Mrs. Theresa Riafia Sante Mamati, a real the wellness coach, Kobina Tabedu, PG Sebastian, lawyer Kwekuya Mwapenzo, Dr. Promise Sepoga, and a host of other seasoned relationship coaches and counselors will all be in attendance. You get to enjoy a good buffet breakfast, giveaways, networking, and other fun activities at a cool rate 
of 150 Ghana CDs per head and 250 for two. Venue is the Best Western Plus Hotel, Nungwa. Time is 6 a.m. through to 10 a.m. and the date is 12 August 2023. Please reserve your spots now. Call or WhatsApp 059-288-9986 for your reservations. This event is supported by Best Western Plus Hotel, Nungwa. Ship Healthcare Specialist Medical Center, Nish, Goba Kinti, and Marie Noel's Spa and Salon. Becoming Mr. and Mrs. All you need to know before marriage. Thank you for staying on news desk with me, Bernice Abubedulansa. The Ministry of Communications and Digitalization, in collaboration with American Tower Corporation, ATC, has introduced a new initiative, Girls in ICT, to help enlighten and educate female students from diverse educational institutions about the potential and opportunities awaiting women in ICT. Sherwin Holman has more in the following report. Over 100 young girls from various basic schools across the country, including those with special needs, participated in the new initiative jointly put together by the Ministry of Communication and Digitalization and the American Tower Corporation with the aim of nurturing the next generation of girls in the telecommunications and infrastructure sectors. The CEO of ATC, Ashtosh Singh highlighted initiatives undertaken towards equipping girls in ICT in some remote communities across the country. As a key player in the provision of wireless infrastructure for network connectivity, preparing the next generation of professionals in this space, especially girls, is very important to us. Because of this, we have worked closely with the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization and remained a key stakeholder and sponsor for this initiative. This initiative also aligns with our Digital Communities Sustainability Project, where we have built 10 fully equipped ICT learning centers across the country to provide ICT education for school children and residents in underserved and under unserved communities. Plans are underway to build more digital communities this year. In a bid to encourage the girls, some female professionals from ATC Ghana shared their personal journeys and experiences in the predominantly male-dominated field. It is pretty obvious that the world of technology is the future. The world of ICT is a vast and ever-evolving landscape, offering endless opportunities for growth, innovation, and creativity. You must be open to embracing this field with confidence, knowing very well that your contributions can shape the future and drive positive change. Some participants also expressed their newfound knowledge and perspectives gleaned from the event illustrating its impact. Yes, I thought that ICT was mainly about just using computers. But now I've known, I know that ICT can also be wireless, can be simulated, and can also be true other, other things. Like it's just interactions between us and our mind. Overall, the Girls in ICT initiative seeks to empower young women with the skills and awareness needed to excel in the evolving digital landscape. Share with Holman's report wrecked to you. And that'll be all for this edition of News Desk. I really appreciate your company. But here's what you can do for more news. Do log on to my Jo.